spirit to cut their ability to reproduce. He even takes their manhood. Because the Nebuchadnezzar understood whoever controls your identity controls your behavior. Come on. Yes. You see, it's a, it's a type of warfare that the enemy is at play with today. He don't go kill you if he can control your identity. He don't go kill you if he defines and determines who you are. What you do, the way you speak, the things you feed yourself on. I love, I love when I talk to young people. It's always be comical because they love to tell me, "Oh, it's my own man," or "It's my own woman." Things don't run me. I just run things. You feel as a puppet or as a controller, anybody can control me. Come on, come on. I say, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We're in the classroom. Everybody left at your school bag. Let me see. We all the one got the same school bag. <laughs> we everybody come on. Let me see the shoes you got on. Wait, wait, wait. All the one got on the same shoes. Yeah. Open your iPod. Take out your phone. Play the first song on the playlist. Wait, wait, wait. All the one is listening to the same music. I told you is your own person. Yeah. <laughs> I told you does run things and nobody don't run you. And all the one of them do the same things in the same circumstances. Because the enemy understands if he controls the identity, if he controls your sense of who you think you are, he controls the way that you behave, and he controls the things that you prioritize, and he controls the things that you value. If you're going to pursue revival from here and now, beloved, the revival that we long for for young people, it must begin with an identity shift. It must begin by a reconciling and a redeeming of who our young people believe they are. Because I don't know if you have been watching. I don't know if you have been connected. But society has come to convince young people today that they are the exact opposite to what God has in store for them. I was telling a group of young women not too long ago that back in my day when I was going to school, men always wanted more than one woman. That ain't a new phenomenon. <laughs> men don't always want more than they can have. That's the truth. When I was going to school, I didn't want as much girls as I could. But the difference between back then and now is that I couldn't let the two girls know about each other. I couldn't let girl one know that I talking to girl two. I had to hide and duck and delete text messages and pretend. But nowadays we live in a society where young girls are comfortable being in such chicks. Yeah. They boast in the ability of being somebody outside woman. You don't think that's an identity problem? Yeah. Oh, you don't know, you know, you know think that's a problem? Yeah. That you don't find comfort in being... We live in a society. I was in Jamaica recently and, and they were trying to explain to me the phenomenon of what's going on. And they would tell me that boys, Jamaican men, will walk up to girls and tell the girl, if you don't want a girl, they don't want you. You think every young girl today that got in lesbianism is a lesbian because they woke up one day and felt that they had feelings for girls? Society have made it normal. I want a girl who got a girl too. <laughs> That's not an identity problem. That's not an identity problem. 
I spend every week for the last four or five years on average at least once a week I have spent my time in prison. And a few weeks ago, I was sitting with some young men and we were talking about consequences. And I was trying to convince them that we know the consequences of our actions before we commit them and we still commit them. Yeah. And I look at a young man who's about 20 years old. I asked him, how long have you been in prison? He said, about two years now. I said, F two and a half years, I came and met you on the block. And I asked you, where would you be in two years time? What would you have told me? He said, either dead or in prison. I said, exactly. He said, don't make a mistake. I was comfortable with that. Wow. That's not an identity problem. There's when me and people always get there when we talk about hanging people again. What's the point of hanging a young man who already made up his mind that he believed to die? What does that do for the society? The point that I'm making is that we have no people who are living under the pressure of a society that doesn't want to physically take them out. It wants to shift their identity. It wants to convince them that they are something that they are not. It wants to convince them that they are otherwise who God created them to be. And if we are going to pursue a revival, if we are going to look to be revived, we have to be looking to see and to find the way. We have to be looking to ask God to come and restore right and proper identity. Amen. It's Christianity 101. Jesus did not die for your wealth. Jesus did not die to increase your Facebook and Instagram followers. Jesus did not die for you to get a proper degree, a house and a car, 2.5 children. And according to the government, that ain't even enough no more. Jesus did not die for your joy for your satisfaction. Jesus died because while we were yet sinners. Jesus died because the book of Ephesians it begins by saying for ye were dead. Anybody know the Greek translation to dead? You know how dead translate in Greek? Dead. You know what a different translation? <laughs> dead means dead. For ye were dead. We love to sing, I was sinking. You were not sinking, you had already drawn. You were dead. But you were dead in your trespasses and sin. But through the blood of Jesus and the Apostle Paul, we can declare any man in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. And everything has become new. It's a new identity. Yes. Amen. It's a new sense of being. It's a new way a man to define and determine ourselves. And the only way our young people begin to pursue or experience any type of revival or any type of growth is if they begin with the understanding that they need an identity shift. And they need to realign their identities with who God has called them to be. It's exactly what happened in Daniel chapter 1. That because four Hebrew boys in the midst of all the pressures in the midst of all the opposition, in the midst of all the attacks of the enemy, did not forget who they were. That though the battle was tough, they remained grounded because they understood who they were. Because they understood who they were, they made decisions that reflected such. So in the midst 
of the most gruesome of conditions, they were able to emerge into the most glorious position. Revival begins with an identity shift, beloved. It begins with reconnecting with who God is. And by extension, understanding directly who we are. Amen. Amen. Stand with me. Let's pray together. Father, we exalt you for who you are. And Father, we pause to acknowledge and to recognize why you died on the cross for us, God. Father, you died because our state of being was heading for destruction, God. You died because you were not just doing sin, but we were sinners. You died because you were not just committing acts of death, but we were dead. You died because you were not just doing things that oppose you, but because you were enemies of God. Father, you died to do more than to forgive us, but to completely transform our identity and to make us new. Father, lift the young people in this house tonight, God, who are living, God, under the oppression and the pressures of the world. Father, young people who are currently living on consequences for actions that they committed, God. Your people who made bad decisions and now they're living in the consequences, God. Your people, Father God, whose conditions have shifted, God. They remember when, God, they remember when life was so much more peaceful. And now, God, because of life situations, they feeling the pressures of life in ways that they never understood before. They're now battling, Father God, with understanding who they are. They're experiencing an identity crisis, God. And they're wrestling with who they are, who they think they are, and who the world says they should be. Father, we pray for your people who are growing and living in a culture, God. That is completely anti-God. A culture that is defined for their destruction. Father, I ask God for such of us, God, that you will give us strength, God. Hallelujah. You will give them clarity yes. Yes. and understanding regarding who they are. That Father, the beast, you will boys in the midst of gruesome conditions. That they will be able to make God-centered decisions. So that they may emerge into the most glorious of positions. A position that reflects one who has been revived. A position that reflects one who is committed to becoming and doing all that God has called him to be. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.